So hello, everybody. My name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. And this is home inspection training class number 18. It's June 20th, uh, 21st, actually. Let me, I can change that look. And um, we're going to start the class in about five minutes. But while I have you here before class starts, um, if you can hear me, that'd be great. Um, I cannot hear you, but you can ask questions and discuss with other students uh, topics during the class and before the class and after the class by um, using that little uh, question box. Uh, should be on, the, on your window screen and you can type in questions. If you can hear me, it'd be great if you could tell me that just to make sure everything's okay. Um, I can't hear you. Um, you should be able to see me. I can't see you, but feel free to ask questions. Um, I'm gonna see if I can get all of my technology working here. We have a few things going on. So I see Gary is with us and about a, a few others. Thanks, Ron. Okay, so we are um, having a, a live class um, at the InterNACHI headquarters building and in our warehouse, we um, have built a house filled with a thousand defects. We call it the house of horrors. And um, it's right behind me actually. And there it is there. And it's a house of horrors, a house built with a thousand defects or more, built under our roof. And um, you, it's open for you to come and visit. So we're in Boulder, Colorado, if you're ever in our neighborhood, just come on by, doors are always open, you can take a look at the house of horrors. One of the things that we did just recently is finish this deck. Um, this deck here, attached to the house, um, has 35 defects. So if you come to the house of horrors, you can check it out and see if you can find the 35 defects. If you can, uh, we give you a prize. Um, the plumbers were just here and they were um, working on the bathroom and all the plumbing system, all the rough in, and there's the tub there through the garage. So we've got a bathroom here, and inside the bathroom, just the bathroom, there are over 30 defects just in the bathroom. So it's gonna be great. We're gonna have running water. Electricians come um, in about a week or so. HVAC guys were already here. So it's the house of horrors. If you're ever in the neighborhood, come on by. It's part of our school, headed by our new director of our school, Ron Huffman. And also wanted to show you a few things before the class officially starts. This is our classroom. So we do um, a lot of hands-on training, but also classroom training. Um, there's our tools behind us. So when you come here to visit or you're a student, you get to test drive about $20,000 worth of tools um, and we can do a classroom. Um, and we also have chapter events here at InterNACHI headquarters. All right, just wanted to show you that a little bit. So let's go to class. Uh, this is our studio, uh, video studio. So we produce training videos. And if you wanted to come by InterNACHI and um, produce a customized marketing video to put on your YouTube channel, business YouTube channel, we'll uh, film, edit, and produce that for you. And I'll take you around. So I'm glad you all can see me. This technology is, technology is awesome when it all works. While I have you here, I might as well show you the office space. So here's our textbooks along the hallway. And here's where staff works. There's staff there. Charisse, Alexa, CK, Marshall, and uh, a bunch of folks in this room. Probably Michelle, Ron. Tanya, Miranda, 
Miss Kim, and that's Jessica, head of marketing. So just show you around. And the class is about to start in a minute, so everyone's gonna start logging in real soon. So let's head into the studio room where we'll do our class. Give me a moment here and squeeze through the door. And this is our, actually our a sound room as well. So we do a lot of sound recording and we do our live webinars in here as well. So I'll hook up uh, my camera. And if you can still hear me, please tell me. If we ever get this connected, um, all you gotta do is log back in. And um, it's being video recorded as well. So if you can hear me, um, that'd be great if you could tell me that. And then we'll get started on our class. Uh, thanks, Ron. So if you just joined, um, you missed a little tour of our House of Horrors, um, a house with a thousand defects built under our roof at InterNACHI headquarters. Feel free to come by. Um, it's a great training experience, whether you're new or uh, a veteran um, inspector. And then we took a tour around the, the office space to see the staff working. And um, this is home inspection training class number 18. Um, thanks, Stephen, Richard, Molly. Awesome that you're here. Um, and my name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. And that's my phone. And we're going to inspect this house. Um, I performed a home inspection at this house. It's a one-story rancher. Um, they finished the attic space, so that's a kind of an interesting thing um, that we're gonna get to. And there's a bunch of defects in it. And we're going to take a look at some video that I shot at the house. I typically um, film um, video of the roof, but um, uh, if my client isn't with me, then I'll videotape a lot of the inspection. Um, and that's part of my brand. So when I do a home inspection, I'm also thinking of um, my brand. What distinguishes me from all of the rest of my competition? So we're gonna go over that as well. I often talk about marketing and branding when performing a home inspection. Uh, if you need to find anything at InterNACHI, if you're interested in something that I say or you just can't find something, uh, we made this page. It's actually a step-by-step -step program to run a successful home inspection business and it's at nachi.org forward slash everything. And soon we're gonna inspect this house. Um, just yesterday, I had Monica email me um, an interesting uh, picture that she found um, when she was doing the home inspection. She thought it was great that we have uh, a bunch of defects in here. Uh, can you see them? Can you see any of the defects? I mean, it's pretty obvious. Um, the plumbing putty is one of them. Um, so you should never see that. Um, so if you ever come across, uh, I would say duct tape or <laughs> uh, plumbing putty um, stuck on <laughs> fittings like this, um, you may have an issue. And if you wanted to share those images, um, you could go to our forum, nachi.org slash F-O-R-U-M and post an image. And we have literally all the time, hundreds of inspectors on the forum um, they're working, they may not be doing an inspection, they're working and they're on the forum discussing things or asking questions and uh, posting an image like that, that um, Monica um, shared. It would be pretty cool. So feel free to do that. And that forum is open to our members. Um, before we get to this inspection, um, let's talk about where do you start a home inspection? Um, I get that question a lot. Where do I begin? How do I begin? What should I do? Um, typically asked by new inspectors, but it's good for us veteran inspectors. I'm a certified master inspector um, to review our procedures, right? So where I start uh, reflects my uh, customer service and my brand. So I like to treat my customers well and give them as much time as possible. That means showing up early. 
where I come from, if you show up on time, you're late, <laughs> right? So I show up early and I schedule um, two jobs. I don't do inspections anymore, um, but I used to for many years in Pennsylvania. So I schedule two jobs a day, one at eight o'clock and one at 12. I get there early, leave the house maybe 6, 30, 7, get, the, get to the job early and I get up on the roof and that's where I start. Now, according to the standards of practice, which is at natchi.org SOP, no home inspector is required to walk upon any roof surface. You're required to inspect the roof, the roof covering, but you're not required to get up on it and walk around. So it's an inspection restriction. It's defined by the scope of your home inspection. You are not required to see everything on the roof because you can't get to everything. Right? So you have to set the expectation of your clients. However, I built homes, I was trained on a ladder, um, know all the safety procedures. I'm very comfortable with roofs um, until they get to about 6, 12. Then I start to hesitate a little bit when it's wet or icy. Um, so I go up on the roof and that was part of my brand. And part of my brand, different from marketing, brand is what distinguishes you from the rest of your competition. And what distinguished me from the rest of my competition was my experience building houses and being up on a roof. And so that became part of my service, my brand. This distinguishes, this distinguished me from the rest of my competition, essentially. Um, so I get up on the roof. Again, according to the standards of practice, you're not required to. You're required to inspect it from the ground level or the eaves, maybe put a ladder up. Um, a short ladder up and take a look from the, the gutter edge, but you're not required to step upon any roof. Um, want to make that clear. If you don't feel safe, don't do it. Don't fall off a ladder. Don't fall off a roof if you don't have to. So here's me taking a picture of the roof and man, I put that image in every inspection report and that distinguishes me again from the rest of my competition. So you have to ask yourself, why are you so special? Why would I hire you instead of the next person? This may be a convincing argument for some. Someone, maybe a coworker of my client, is going to see my client's report and they're going to say, oh, that, boy, he gets up on the roof. That's awesome. And when I get up early, when I get up on the roof early at the inspection, I get to my inspection early, I try to stay up on the roof for a while until my client actually pulls up in the driveway and I wave to them from the roof. So it's kind of like a, a marketing thing. Everything I do reflects the standards of practice, the foundation for which you build an inspection service, but it also is part of my brand. So on this house, we have many surfaces, many fields, and I want to take a picture of all of the fields, every component, especially the things that penetrate through the roof surface. So I want to take a look at the roof covering, and when I perform an inspection, I talk about the roof covering, not the roof system. The roof system incorporates, heck, everything. Uh, plywood clips, um, underlayment, um, ice and water shield, uh, flashing, drip edges. I can't see all that, right? So I want to make sure that I say things that, I, that um, is in the scope of my inspection and my, the terminology that I use is really important. So roof covering. I'm inspecting the roof covering because that's all I can see. And there are many different types here. We have low slope roof and asphalt shingle three tab, right? You should be able to identify the roof covering material. You could estimate the age too, but that's not required. I like to tell my clients if the roof surface is at the end of its service life, which might not necessarily be a defect in itself, but I like to give them an idea. And I'm looking for any damage. I wanna show my client also that I inspect systems and components up close. This is the ridge vent. And when I'm inspecting the roof covering, I'm also thinking about components that are interconnected to other systems in a house because a house is a system of interdependent parts, each part affecting others, right? So if you affect one, if you take out the ridge vent, now you affect not just the roof covering, but the interior attic ventilation system or the, the interior spaces. So when I'm in the inside of the house, and maybe there's an unfinished attic space there, I have to remember I had a ridge vent on the roof. Where? Right down the center. 
and taking pictures helps me perform a really good inspection and archives my experience through the house and on the roof. And um, I take a picture of everything. I try to throw those pictures, as many pictures as I can, in the inspection report, the good ones, but not all of them. So I have a low slope roof covering here, asphalt, they, they hot mop it, and they seal it up. So I'm going to see nice tight seams. Um, it looks like it's okay. I see some bubbling, which could indicate several things, I don't know, moisture, uh, a random number of things. But I don't have to diagnose, so I'm looking for blisters, bubbles, um, condition, general condition, seams. Um, so there's some erosion, looks like some, th this is not um, hail damage. Um, Internet actually has a wind and hail damage um, course. So it's something else. So bubbles and blisters could be multiple layers. And I think it is. It feels really spongy actually underneath my feet. One of the advantages of walking on a roof surface. The seams look good. The other shingle roof is old, but okay. So we have a green asphalt shingle roof, three tab, and a gray um, laminated shingle roof covering. Um, if you're weak on how to perform a home inspection, especially um, low slope roof materials, we have a great course. It's the how to perform roof inspections course. It's free online to InterNACHI members. How's everybody doing? Can you hear me? Because we're right in the middle of the roof system. Everybody okay? Can you hear me? Molly? Richard? Good. Thanks, Gary. Awesome. Um, so when you become a member of InterNACHI, you have access to that forum that I talked about previously. You have access to the online courses to train yourself. We have the exam, uh, online inspector examination. When you take the online inspector examination, you should take it every few years. When you take it, it'll tell your strengths and your weaknesses. And those weaknesses can be strengthened by taking online training. And that's one of the main benefits of being a member of InterNACHI. You have free access to all of the online training that we provide, all of it. When you become a member, you have access to all of the online training, right? And take your time, and when you want to become certified, we have that type of program. So here's um, some information. We even have a, um, an illustration team. You saw the staff before we walked around. I don't know if you missed it, but we walked around the office at InterNACHI headquarters and showed um, all the staff there. Half of them are um, illustrators and designers. Well, most of them are, I, I would say. And they do things like this to help us understand and explain and communicate um, what a, a low slope roof material system uh, installation components, things like that, um, what that involves. I also love these illustrations for my inspection report. So if I'm going to inspect a house that has a low slope roof, I'm going to take pictures, take video, stick those pictures in the report, um, allow my client to enjoy the video, and then I would also add illustrations. And all of the, I think all of them, um, most if not all of them, allow you to enter illustrations um, into the software. A lot of the software providers, sorry, allow you to enter illustrations and add illustrations. I just like these pictures. It shows that I get up close and personal <laughs> with the roof covering. I want to make sure my client knows that I've inspected this up close. So these are kind of like my brand shots. These are images that define who I am as a home inspector in my company. Uh, the seams look good, the edges look good, I see the fiber, but I don't like, um, oh, we did that. I don't, oh, chimney stack. So this is a roof penetration. It's also a different system. I handle the chimney, the fireplaces, the wood burning stoves um, separately as a system in my inspection report. And we're going to have a home inspection uh, class coming up where we'll inspect and then enter um, data into uh, software. Um, that's coming up. Uh, but and we have to figure out how to handle systems. Do you inspect room by room, system by system, or a combination? I, I do a combination. And this is a system that I'm inspecting now, but I'm also inspecting the roof system. So again, the house is a system of interdependent parts. This part, this system affects the roof system. It's a chimney stack, right? It's square, square flue, um, 
this is um, northern climate, uh, Pennsylvania, cold climate. So we have heating systems, uh, fuel burning appliances. And um, I know that this is not a fireplace. Fireplaces um, typically are rectangular. Uh, the flue is rectangular. This is a square one. Uh, high probability that this is a fuel burning heating system, HVAC system, um, installed in the basement of this house. And um, this is the flue. Um, I'm not required, according to the standards of practice, to inspect flues, but for this one, I'm going to. And um, I'm just going to drop my camera in the flue and take a look. When I do that, sometimes I see a big hole. Uh, if I don't see a big hole, I don't say anything because I'm not required to inspect the interior flue liner. Now, how do you inspect this from the ground, You're, you may be saying? Well, um, inspectoroutlet.com has this amazing tool that I used to use way back when and um, they have a new one now. It's simply an extension pole. It's, it's much better than a, a painter's uh, extension pole. Don't get that from Home Depot. So you want something that extends 30 feet and it's only seven pounds. And it comes in a really nice case, a four inch PVC tube. Um, so you can carry it, you can mount it on your roof, uh, stick it in the back truck, uh, pick up or something like that. And the idea is to inspect the roof covering materials or the top of the chimney safely from the ground. So you stick your wireless camera up here and you can buy a wireless camera uh, as an option. You can um, have an iPad, iPhone, a tablet holder here and you can also buy that device. And then they communicate to each other and you can control the camera and take pictures and video um, from the bottom while you're holding the spectroscope, it's called, and the camera's doing all the work, and you can move it around. Um, remember, drones are just for fun. So, and, you know, when the, there's five mile an hour winds, you really can't uh, fly a drone uh, for fun. So I highly recommend staying on the ground, according to standards of practice, and using a spectroscope. So you can get up there. Me, I'm up there like a crazy nut, right? So I'm seeing that, oh, here's the URL, uh, inspectoroutlet.com. So if you go there, let me just go there real quick. This is InterNACHI's e-commerce partner. And if you go and you type in um, a roof in the search field, I think that'll work there, yeah. So there's Nikolai, the owner of Inspector Outlet. And um, there's the pole there, it goes all the way up and he's holding it, and you can see the devices and the wireless camera. You can buy those from Inspector Outlet as well. And in the wintertime, when it's slippery or when the roof is wet, boy, I'm not going up on the roof, even though I could. I have the skills to go up on the roof, but I'm not dumb. So uh, I'm going to use something that's safe, because I'm coming home after my inspection. That's what we want. Uh, thank you all. Michael, Richard, yes, we can hear you, can hear you. Stacy asks, what software do you use? I don't perform home inspections anymore. I used to. I used to use Inspect View from Porter Valley. Um, you can take a look at that and Google it. I don't have any recent experience with that. But there are many to choose from. Um, I, probably the leaders are Home Inspector Pro. Home Inspector Pro is pretty much in the lead. Um, one of the cool things I like about Home Inspector Pro is not just the ability to import hundreds of images into your software with a click of a button in a couple seconds. But um, you can do, it works really well on mobile devices. I use iPhone, so it'll work on that. And um, incorporates video in the software. That's really a good feature to look for if you're choosing, considering which software manufacturer provider. Um, and the other one is uh, how easily does it convert the report to something that your client can see and access? And is there a summary report? I like summary reports. Um, and also, um, I like to make comments with color, defects, material defects, major defects. Should be in red, right? The other ones could be in black. So that's what I do, personally. If there's something that I need to tell my client that's really important, a defect. So uh, look for that feature when you're trying to choose software. And then, um, if you're an InterNACHI member, um, most providers, software providers, um, have some kind of exclusive discount to InterNACHI members. 
and you can look at those discounts from Inspector Outlet. So again, go to Inspector Outlet, navigation menu on the left side, click Software, and then choose from there. And most uh, software providers, if not all of them, provide some kind of free trial basis, a uh, 30-day trial or something like that. Um, another reason why I like Home Inspector Pro is that um, the customer service is really good. And also, if you are a home energy score assessor, that's a separate program. It's like an energy auditor through InterNACHI, but you don't need an infrared or a blower door. Um, you can do a score in uh, with a click of a button. You click the score button, and it produces a score based upon the data that you've already gathered as a home inspector. So there's no double entry. So it's kind of cool. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. So the flashing around the chimney stack is not great. Masonry chimney. Um, there's the flu. What I do is just I take a picture, and then I do a little zoom of the picture, and I'm just looking for anything that's obvious. If you're weak on how to inspect fireplaces, stoves, and chimneys, of course, um, we, uh, chimneys, we have a course. That's always our solution, right? And here's a round flue. That's kind of interesting. And here's our square flue, the clay lining from an oil-fired forced air HVAC system furnace. Uh, let's see. Let's keep going. So the, the cracks on the top, I'm not too concerned about, but I don't like the, the tar flashing, the roof uh, flashing around the uh, the roof sealant around the chimney flashing. Not very good at all. So I'm a little concerned about that. And I'm concerned about the second low sloped roof material. The roof covering is really poor, in poor condition. There's actually large chunks that are missing, a lot of cracking. Um, looks like they just coated it just before I got there. Um, so I'm not that happy with that material. I want to convey this condition to my client as best I can with text, obviously, in my inspection report. Video is going to help me a lot, and a lot of close-up pictures like that. Looks like the Grand Canyon there. Uh, sorry about that. And um, just a, a word about how do you report defects. Um, a lot of inspectors say this phrase, no visible evidence of, and then you insert the defect. A lot of them use this phrase when reporting on WDO, wood destroying organisms, say no visible evidence. Here's two problems with saying that phrase. The visible in court could be argued against you. Uh, if you use the word visible, somebody could argue that it was visible at the time of the inspection, so you don't want to be there. Evidence suggests, the word evidence suggests, you shouldn't use it, because it suggests that um, evidence um, uh, sustains. Evidence back then should be present here. But we know as home inspectors, home inspectors that things change. Um, the roof condition can change. Water marks can appear. So if you, don't, if you say no evidence of, well, somebody could, no visible evidence of, no, so that they could, um, they could argue against you on the use of visible, maybe it was visible, and evidence suggests that um, it's a permanent condition that existed back when you performed a home inspection. So we recommend using this phrase or something like it. I did not observe any indications of this defect during my inspection. That's all you're really doing. You're observing things. There could be a defect, but if you didn't observe it, then you don't have any obligation to report it. And a lot of things are outside of our scope of a visual inspection. We can't see everything. So my client, I set my expectations of my client by telling them, expect to find problems that were not discovered during my inspection because I may not have observed it. There may not have been any indications of that defect. And um, it was a, a, a quick visual inspection at a sp specific moment in time. You know, so conditions change and things are revealed, especially when a property is exchanged hands. Um, let's see. So Molly asks, would you um, recommend installing a spark arrestor? Um, 
No, uh, on a fireplace, sure, because you're burning wood and things um, in a fireplace and the flue comes up. Um, I would recommend actually just a rain cap because I don't want rain to go back down the flue of this heating system and wash out soot. And that could happen, especially in this climate. Pennsylvania, we call it Pennsylvania. So it could really rain and go straight down the flue. And actually we see evidence of that in the basement. There are no gutters on these low slope roofs. I love gutters. Collect that rain water. Um, as you can tell, the rain runoff has eroded away the paint that's on the old aluminum siding. Um, so that could be attended to. So these are second floor um, attic or finished room windows that you see in the siding has been affected because there's no um, gutter system. Flashing around the penetrations, there's the edge and I can see it's been doubled or tripled up so I know it's a really thick material. I think they just put another layer on top which is no big deal but soon uh, that may have an effect especially the extra weight. Gutters seem good. Some uh, lifted nails on the shingle tabs, no big deal. They need to be pounded down and sealed up. And then, as I said, I take video. There are two different shingles on the roof. The front green shingle appears to be a, a newer shingle and in good shape, young roof. The gray shingles on the back seem to be older, but still in good shape. So I take video of my inspections for my clients and that's part of my brand as well. I don't want them up on the roof with me but what I do is I take video, well I have two cameras in my nail pouch, farmer's pouch, uh, framing nail pouch, um, digital camera here um, taking pictures and video camera taking video and then I um, go into the kitchen, I plug in my USB, I turn the um, computer around and I play the videos for my clients and they are just shocked that they are actually looking at the roof that I inspected um, and they don't have to go up on the roof with me. So that's pretty amazing for my clients. On the left side there's a flat roll roofing material. It's in fair condition. I'm not sure how old it is. But the material is starting to erode and curl and the seams are slightly lifting a little bit. So it's an older material, I believe. The edges seem to be in good shape. The seams seem to be well sealed. And on the right side, and I go over here. The chimney stack on the left side. Appears to be in fair shape. Some normal cracking and weathering of the masonry exterior. However, the flashing area. It's heavily sealed. May have indicated a, a water leak in the past. And the bad roof. The roll roofing material on the right side of the house is in poor condition at the end of its service life. Replacement is recommended. Large sections of the roofing material are actually cracked off and missing. The material itself is in very poor condition. Large cracks opening up. It's not reliable. Water penetration, this roof needs to be torn off and replaced. You know, a picture's worth a thousand words, but when you show somebody a video, um, it's very convincing. So that's the kind of impact that my inspection service had, and that was part of my brand as well. I shot video, and I really convinced my clients and their agents um, about the condition of anything that I inspected. Um, Gary asks, how many pages in your report? We're going to go over the inspection report if you hang in there um, for this inspection as well. Um, and I think we have about 50 uh, pages. That's about average for me, 40 to 60. Um, some of the big um, um, homes that are 3,500 square feet or two HVAC systems or multiple roof conditions, uh, um, major defects. If it's an older house, um, I'll probably push 70, 70 pages. And I'll take probably 300 to 400 pictures on average. Um, a home that has that is more uh, that has um, that is older, bigger, or has more defects. I'll take maybe five or 600 pictures. Um, I provide all of those photos to my clients. Um, 
back way back when we used to burn them on a, a DVD, CD, and now you know you can do USB or uh, iCloud or something like that service. Um, and um, I never had any hesitation in providing all of my pictures to my clients. Um, and uh, we could talk about that later. But um, in my inspection report, I probably put um, 10, 20% of the pictures that I took all together. Um, I just wanted to get, well, you'll see the report, but I wanted to get the major pictures that communicated things well. Um, I wanted those pictures in the inspection report. And I worked really hard every day on my inspection report. The categories, the descriptions, the observations, the sentences, so I can click through really fast. I used a mobile device, by the way. Um, I wrote my inspection report while I inspected. And I worked on my report so that I can be really quick, um, so that I can talk more than, than write and while I'm doing the inspection. And um, I wanted to print out that report at the inspection if my client requested it. I at least printed out the summary report um, so that they can take action right after my inspection. And um, that's what my clients um, really wanted, that summary sheet. They hardly read the entire inspection report. I assumed that since I got a lot of referrals from my clients, I kept in contact with my clients so that they can speak well of me to their friends and family and coworkers. Um, I assumed that they passed around my inspection report, maybe the printed one or the electronic one. Um, and so that was my best piece of marketing. I always had really good, robust, juicy, great looking, professionally written um, home inspection reports. Because my business card, uh, people throw away your business card. Your flyer, um, maybe. Maybe they'll hold it on to it because it's professionally designed by InterNACHI's marketing team. But my inspection report says it all. Um, I should be able to convince a potential client to hire me based upon their reading of my home inspection report. That's how I thought of my inspection report. Thorough, comprehensive, well-written, and really professional with a lot of shock and awe, right? Um, this house is built out of concrete blocks, CMUs, concrete masonry units. I owned a house built out of concrete. Um, I'm assuming that, um, that it's gonna crack here and there, no big deal. It, there's some cement coating or parging and then they typically paint it. This house was painted just recently, um, just before I showed up. So um, if I see cracks now, I'd be surprised. Um, they were probably already patched, so I'm gonna take pictures of the surface of the exterior as much as possible and the surface of the driveway. This is an old asphalt driveway. Um, looks like they had some additional parking that was needed. So they put in some, looks like a base coat, like the finish coat didn't go in. They didn't put in the finish coat or they told the, the folks, just roll some stuff in here, roll it back and forth and get out. So that's a probably a cheap way to get some asphalt in there. So that's not a finish coat, right? It's a base coat. The finish coat is nice and it's a, a smooth. Um, some cracked windows, no big deal. Um, some weathering on the garage door. The doorbell doesn't work. Uh, I, I was called a couple of times about doorbells. And then we just decided to stick that doorbell category in our uh, software as one of the tabs, one of the sentences, so that we never miss a doorbell. Now, you can't go into the house without ringing the doorbell. You got to ring that doorbell and then put it in the report that it worked or didn't and take a picture of it. Um, it's not required by the standards of practice. No low voltage wiring, anything is required, but well, the thermostat, but um, it just, it was that customer service that people got from me. I inspected the doorbell. Uh, oil filled, uh, there's a tank, an oil tank, and this is the oil fill pipe and the vent pipe is next to it. And um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, cold climates, especially Northeast, we're crazy. We burn oil. We take it from the ground, we put it in a tank, we ignite it, and we heat up a heat exchanger and blow air across it, and that's a furnace. So this is the oil fill and vent pipe on the outside. Now I'm inspecting the exterior, right? But I'm thinking of other systems and components. So maybe go back. So I did the roof, right? We inspected the roof, found some problems. Large section needs to be replaced. Some sealant around the masonry chimney stack, no good. Gutters are missing. Anything else? 
oh, some nails are backing out. We enter all that in, I used to, in a mobile device. Before I get on my ladder to step off the roof system and go down to the exterior system, I'm already done writing my inspection report for that system. I'm done. I can now go down and talk. I can talk to my client, shake their hand, pass out cards, um, take my client around the house for the first time. I've never done it. It's new. I take them around. I show them some big, big things, maybe some maintenance issues, yada, yada. And then I send them in because that's where they want to go. They want to go in. My clients wanted to go in. Maybe your clients want to stay outside. Mine wanted to go in and measure things and look around and snoop around and take a look and think about home improvements and upgrades and things like that, right? So I let them go. Then I go a second time around and really inspect the home with my devices. You need one of these. Where is it? GFCI tester because the exterior receptacles, um, even on the deck, should be GFCI tested. Um, I'm looking uh, at all the components around the exterior and I'm entering that stuff, right? But doing the exterior, I'm hitting stuff from other systems. Here's the electrical system. The electrical line is within reach of the yard. I could reach it. I could touch it. I could jump up and grab the main electrical service line. Cables are right there. And I'm not talking phone and telephone, uh, telephone or, or cable, TV cable. That is main electrical line right there. So that's really bad. Uh, bad clearance. So that's an electrical hazard that needs to be fixed. And um, I don't know what that thing is. Um, could have been the old meter from maybe a 60 amp service coming into the house. Not sure. Anything I don't know, I take a picture of and put it in the report and I tell my client to ask the seller. I don't have to diagnose. As a home inspector, we don't have to figure everything out. We just have, have to um, report on the observations of indications of defects. Right? Uh, electric meter upgraded, but it's only 100 amps, and it's split. So this service had an electric hot water tank, I'm assuming. There's the electric line going in. And the main line, 100 amp, I can tell by the size. Um, but I also like to confirm on the inside. I'm grounding electro conductor, the wire going in. I'm not looking for the rod. I could, but anything that's sticking up, um, I want to pound it in. I want a good acorn clamp on it. Um, and there's a Bilco door. We call them Bilco doors. Uh, exterior steel door. You pull it up and you go down concrete steps, typically. It could be wood into the basement. It could be the main entrance to the basement. In this house, this is just a secondary entrance. And I just want to make sure everything is all sealed up. Exterior water faucets in cold climates need to be frost free. That means when you turn off the handle, it actually drains about a foot, right, through the wall from where it's warm. The water is stopped where it's warm on the inside of the house. So it never freezes because when water freezes, it expands and it could explode. This is not a frost free hose bib. So that's a defect. That's an easy catch. Um, anything with more than two steps, I call it out as a defect safety feature. Think of it in a very old person walking up or somebody with a uh, physical challenge walking up steps. Code may say three, four, um, local authority having jurisdiction, the local code inspector may say something else. But me as a home inspector, my personal opinion is this is a defect, a safety hazard, a railing is needed. So um, we're not code inspectors, for goodness sake. Wood rot. So at any door or window, one of the things that I do is I take a look at the top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right of any hole that comes through the exterior wall. For, so for a door, I'm looking at top left, top right, bottom left, oh, wood rot. So it's a very easy thing. Could be wood destroying insect, could be carpenter ant, not sure. I'm not doing a termite inspection here, but I'm gonna call that out. And there's some more damage there. And I don't know what that is. Pipe, hole through the garage door, it looks, or garage wall, it looks like. Windows, old, single pane windows, mm, 60 years old. They're in good condition for the garage. But I just want my client to know. 
and they really did a terrible job with the putty. I've fixed these. Uh, it's a real uh, uh, interesting project. <laughs> uh, you either love it or you hate it, but you can fix those and make them really nice. And weathered condition, no big deal. Um, these are kind of like delayed maintenance issues, but I put them in the report because it only takes a second. When you take pictures, it's great. And when you have a mobile device, you can really build a, a really nice inspection report to almost cover everything from peeling paint to broken doorknobs. The exterior is a concern. I don't want old stumps in the yard, especially um, ones that um, could invite infestation close to the house. Um, and there's debris also. I'm not sure where the property line is. I really don't care. I'm just taking pictures of things and reporting them. It only takes a moment. I'm pretty sure this shed is part of the house that I'm inspecting. Um, no one is here. Actually, it's a vacant house, so I can't ask the seller, but it's in really terrible shape. The roof is terrible. Uh, the structure is um, just rotten, really bad condition. And I've got multiple old thermostats. None of them are programmable. Boy, if you swap out an old manual thermostat with a programmable one, you can save a lot of energy. You can pay for the thermostat upgrade by the energy savings that it um, that you enjoy by installing. And I have another thermostat of some kind. I don't know what this is. It turns out to be um, an old humidifier. There's my oil-fired furnace. Um, so before we get to um, this system, does anyone have any questions? Any questions from anyone? Can I ask you a question? I want to know if you are If you are a, um, a member of InterNACHI, just a quick poll. I'd love to know if you're a member of InterNACHI. So if you're watching this on YouTube right now, you probably can't see this poll, and you certainly can't take it. This is only for the live class students. So um, are, are you an InterNACHI member? Are you not an InterNACHI member? Are you interested in joining at a discount? So we offer a nice big chunky discount for non-members who want to join. But you have to be attending the live class. If you're watching this on YouTube, just email me. Um, so I'm going to stop the poll in just a little bit because we're three quarters, 75% have voted. I'm going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. I'll share the results. Hope you can see them. So most of you are members of InterNACHI. Some of you are not, and you're interested in joining at a discount. If you're interested in joining at a discount, email me, ben at internachi.org, ben at internachi.org, and I'll set you up. Um, if you're a member and you want uh, some extra value for being here, um, email me too. Uh, I'll send you a nice little box of goodies. So, Jose, awesome. Thanks for being here. Uh, if you have any questions, just throw them out if you want. Um, so here's a really cool website that I came across. And I don't know them. Um, I don't know who they are. But they have a really cool website to help you determine the age of a heating system or a hot water tank. So you need the name of the manufacturer and the serial or model number. So uh, I've got it. It's, it says Brock. You can't see it. It's a little blurry. But it's a HVAC system, Brock. And here is the serial number, because I take a picture of every manufacturing label, right? We should. Here, go, here's the uh, website to go to. It's buildingcenter.org. Buildingcenter.org. You go there, and you click on this button for HVAC. And you look for the manufacturer, and it's Brock. And there it is. So they have different formats for the serial number, but this is mine. 06, D0604. So the first, the second and third number is the month. And the four, uh, well, maybe, uh, well, it's this first and second number, because the first digit is a, a alpha numeric. So the, the, the one, two, three, fourth and fifth alpha numeric um, 
position is the year. That'll tell me the year. So if I go back to this one, D09, that's the month, 02, that's the year, 2002. It was built in 2002. And I did this inspection way back when, um, several years ago, so it's relatively new. Um, I feel rest assured that this system has life left in it. There really shouldn't be any major defects, but I'm going to turn it on anyways because I want to hear it and see it function. And how it works is, if you're unfamiliar with oil, it's crazy. You have an oil tank in the basement. Sometimes it's underground, which is not very good. In the basement or next to the heat heating system, um, not below it. It uses gravity, essentially. And um, there's an oil line that goes into a burner. That burner mystifies and ignites the oil. And and it ignites it, and it blows flames inside a heat exchanger. And that heat exchanger takes a lot of heat, right? So it's kind of thick and other different types of material, not like a, um, a gas, natural gas uh, flame heat exchanger. Boom. Blowing he flames, nice, good, um, should be like yellow, orangey stuff, not black, sooty, flames inside a heat exchanger, and then the blower turns on after the heat exchanger turns, uh, cranks up, gets hot. Blower turns on and circulates air around that heat exchanger and forces air, forced furnace, forces air through ductwork into the home. Pretty crazy. There's no central air conditioning system on this unit. But what do I do? I go through the components. So when I take a picture of a system, I take a, a like a 30,000 foot view, you know, way back, take a picture of the entire system, and then I focus in on components. And I'm inspecting them and taking pictures of them at the same time. So there's the oil burner shutoff to turn off the unit, so like a service switch. There's the um, component that senses the temperature of the heat exchanger and the thermostat control, and there's the burner. Um, it has a little window port to see inside the heat exchanger. Um, there's shutoff valve to turn off the oil. To the uh, There's a humidifier. Remember that thermostat upstairs before we came down? Um, that is disconnected, it no longer works, it's pretty nasty, you should just remove it. And there's the flue, the heat uh, combustion gases go through the heat exchanger and through um, the return duct area of the furnace and into the chimney stack. And there's a damper control. Um, there's a lot of heat going up the flue, this kind of uh, opens up and allows air to control the draft um, so it doesn't overheat. Um, there's the air filter, um, disposable, it's clean, installed correctly, um, and there's the location. And then we've got these low voltage things, looks like doorbells, but they're actually zone dampers in the what I found out, and I just assumed, but I found out and confirmed later, um, little dampers in the ductwork. There's the oil line, should be above ground, there's the oil tank, um, oil fill and vent. There's the oil gauge. There's the belly of the tank. It should, it, it could have rust, some surface rust. But what I do is I get my screwdriver out of my tool bag and I hit. I hit the legs. I hit the belly. I actually probe it a little bit. If I go through and cause a problem, well, you know, good for me. I, I discovered a major defect. But uh, I want to make sure that this tank is sound solid. And when you do it a couple times, there's um, a uh, air pressure system. There's a way to test a tank with air pressure and a pump, but I don't do that. There's a service. Um, and then they test the tank and they add a warranty or something like that. I never got into selling those extra things. Just a nasty looking system. But, you know, looks like the person who services and cleans the unit um, forgets to bring a pan to catch the oil because there's or a rag. Uh, there's just oil spilled all over the place. You walk into the basement, you get that pungent odor of oil. Um, but let's see if we can see it. Uh, on the top side, there's watermarks, brown stains coming from the bottom of the concrete block foundation wall on top of the wet, um, top of the white paint that was applied to the foundation wall, and it's puddled up near the oil filter. So that is indications, I observed indications of previous water penetration after the wall was painted white. So something's going on. They painted the wall white to make it look really nice to sell the house. I come in and do an inspection and I find wa brown watermarks on top of that wall, uh, uh, paint 
on the wall. It's not a puddle on the floor, it's dripping down from the wall, the concrete block wall. So now, ah, I've got water. I observe indications of water penetration. It's really good. I love it. One of the things that I wish I had was infrared. And FLIR makes an infrared camera moisture meter combo. So this is, uh, uh, this is an infrared camera. Oh, sorry. So you can see me. It uses an infrared screen to help you find moisture problems, right? Identify them. And then it has a, um, it's a moisture meter. So I don't know if you can see that, but no, you can't. Well, there's a number that's registering on the amount of moisture on my skin, right? Um, so this is kind of cool. You can, very low resolution, right? It's not an infrared camera device or thermographer device, but you know, it could help you find, visually find the problems. And then you can non-invasively take the moisture measurement. It's really cool. This is the kind of stuff that can help you get your phone to ring off the hook. Brand yourself as the inspector who includes these amazing tools to help you be more accurate and provide a great service to your client. Um, GFCI tester, I showed you one before, right, on the exterior. You got this one as a basic one, right? You click the button and it shows you. But you could also grab one of these too. This is pretty awesome. You know, just something bigger and better. You can test voltage, uh, AFCIs. Um, you can use a laser thermometer. It's another tool. You can find all these tools at Inspector Outlet, by the way. Um, this one's a killer. Uh, without it, it, it's a killer. Um, it's a little tool to show voltage, right? So is there something in the camera shot that's on? No. But hopefully you heard that. So it turns red. Um, I'm trying to find a wire that's live. Yep. So it turns red and uh, it gives you an audible signal. This has saved my life many times, this little device. And get that on Inspector Outlet. And we'll go over some other additional tools too. But man, fill up your tool bag, your pouch with tools so that you can identify and confirm moisture coming in. There's moisture marks on top of the white paint on this foundation wall tucked behind this oil tank. All right, now I am, uh, Carl asks, any recommendations on inspection exam study or study book packages? Yep, so if you go to um, nachi.org forward slash everything, that's a web page we talked about earlier in class nachi.org slash everything. Um, or if you want to just email me, I can direct you to um, an online inspector exam that you can take. It's free and open and online, open to everyone. You don't have to join Internachi in order to take this exam. The importance of taking this exam is it helps at the end of the exam, it tells you where you're strong and where you're weak. So you can use that as um, a gauge on what you need to learn. So where you're weak, you go to the online courses and access them by becoming a member and then take training courses. So if you're weak, if the exam tells you you're weak in electrical, you take our electrical courses, video courses, watch our videos and take our electrical courses and strengthen your weaknesses. Um, and then uh, we have books, we have guides on every course and you open up a course, an online course in the first a uh, slide or two, we'll have a study guide. You can download that. It's a free download PDF guide. You can buy all of our textbooks. Uh, you saw them when we were walking through the Internet G headquarters, uh, hanging on the wall. Uh, you can buy all of our textbooks. You can buy the PDF version as well. And they're all at inspectoroutlet.com. Inspectoroutlet.com. All right, so we got a garage here. Remember, we inspected it from the outside. And... Um, there's no garage door opener. But there is a torch, um, uh, a torsion spring. And this torsion, torsion spring produces torque. <laughs> I can't get that out. And the torque is transmitted through a shaft to the cable drums on the side where the wires are dropping down, right? On the sides of the door. And it picks up the bottom part of that door and uh, it rolls it up, right? Creating a linear force upwards. 
and lifting up that weight. And all together, the spring, the shaft, the drums, the wires, uh, that's an assembly referred to as a counterbalance. So that just about anybody can lift up a 150 pound garage door with uh, two fingers. So it doesn't have a garage door opener, but it does, it does have that, that counterbalance. There's a lot of problems in the garage. Um, I don't like the fire hazards, um, fire compromises, fire wall compromises. The fire wall is missing essentially in this garage. The ceiling is made out of the fiberboard. It's not firewall, not drywall, not plaster. Um, a fire started in the garage, which is very common. Folks uh, ignite oil or gas when working on a car in the garage and boom, it just goes up and it'll blow through windows, doors, or ceiling, wherever there isn't a firewall to, re to reduce that spread of fire. This will light up fast. So everything is um, combustible in this garage. Ceiling, walls, everything. But I take a, a picture of just about everything. Um, insulation is installed upside down. Um, in cold climates, you want that vapor barrier, retarder on, on the warm side. Um, so a lot of things wrong in this garage. GFCIs, no, missing GFCIs, a lot of garbage. I'm taking pictures of inspection restrictions um, and, and the condition, the general condition of the garage so that when my client moves in and sees that it, it's very different, it's all cleaned up. Um, I want to make sure that I couldn't see everything. Hey, there's a metal door installed, um, fire rated door. And there's water, water faucets. One faucet is uh, missing a handle, it's not working. One is on, it's not frost free. Um, the garage is not heated, it's unconditioned, so it's going to get cold. The doors are not weather tight, weatherproof. The door locks don't work. The windows are old, single pane, they're cracked. Missing GFCI receptacles, uh, missing pane here. Um, and more firewall problems. And the garage door on the other side, that doesn't have a tor torsion spring, um, just has the regular springs, um, is um, a hazard. It's really a safety hazard. Uh, just a few nails actually hold up the garage door. Um, any, this is the largest, a garage door is the largest moving object in a home typically, and you want it to be safe. So you want to open and close it a couple times, test it if you can in different ways, and um, make sure the door openers work. But really the attachments is where I focus my attention on garage doors. And again, some cracking of the concrete masonry units. No big deal. Owned a house like this. That's what happens. I'm looking for very large separations, um, typically not at window lintels, uh, window headers. Um, that's a typical crack in movement. Um, I'm looking for something major in an area like in the corner. Oh, there's a drain floor clogged. Not sure what's going on there. Probably doesn't go anywhere anymore. Maybe down into the um, backyard or drywall of some kind. And we've got a doorbell, I think. Probably doesn't work anymore. Or, yeah, something's there. Um, looks like a new expansion tank for a well, a private well private water supply system with a submersible pump. The pump is down at the bottom of the well, stainless steel pump, pumps water up into a tank that has a bladder filled with air under pressure. The uh, fixtures turn on, the tank drains, um, the bladder expands, loses pressure. There's a little sensor, pressure sensor, a little gauge that you can adjust um, and it kicks on when it's low, it fills up the tank. The pump kicks on, fills up the tank, and it cycles like that. And it looks like there's just new components, new motor, new pump, new tank. Nice. All, all good. All good. Main water shutoff valve right there. Uh, so that's the water coming in, water going out, the drain waste vent pipe is there, sewer pipe, cast iron. Looks like there's been plenty of leaking in the past. I like to tap on the cast iron drain pipes with my screwdriver and um, a lot of watermarks. I always um, report observed indications of prior roof leaks or water leaks. So there's a lot of water leaks here. Different materials being used.
not too happy about that. And there's a water leak there underneath the first floor tub and missing um, uh, handles at the valves. Electric hot water tank, there's the hot water source, electric line coming in, it's grounded. The year, the date uh, it was manufactured, the capacity, the size, water shutoff valve on the cold water line coming in. The TPR at the top of the hot water tank should be extended to the floor, an easy defect to call out. There's the main electrical panel. Ah, David asks, do you normally inspect the burner functions and or heat exchanger by removing any face? No, I just uh, turn the burner on. Same thing with the um, a natural gas uh, furnace. I just want to see the flames. I want to see it cycle through. I want to see it turn on. I want to hear the blower turn on. Um, I'm not really getting in there. Um, I'm not testing CO. Um, I'm not required to in Pennsylvania or Colorado. Um, so you follow the state rules about your reporting and your inspecting and what you're required to do and not required to do. Um, and if you're required to remove plates, go ahead. But I really don't. I don't. Although I'll remove this dead front cover on this electrical panel. Um, do you recommend taking live training class to become an inspector or is online training enough? Um, about half the country regulates home inspectors and out of those that regulate, less than half, maybe just a handful, um, require live training of some kind. And it's usually just a portion of it. Um, Florida is a great example. Florida used to require 120 hours of live, hands-on, in-field training. Very expensive, almost impossible for an individual to do. Just can't take off that much work in order to become a new, prof um, a new professional in that state. So um, you can take all of it now online. So you can become a certified home inspector online. I would also recommend um, inspecting your own home many times, your friends' homes, your family's homes, um, your entire neighborhood for free, um, just to get that experience and to crash and burn with your software because I know you're going to um, when you become a new inspector. And then find a local chapter. Uh, if you're anywhere in Colorado, we have three, uh, Denver, Colorado Springs, and Boulder. Find a local chapter and rub elbows with your friendly competitors. And um, if you need um, some live training, like in Florida, we have um, a dozen schools and trainers all over the state, Indiana, Illinois. We're very strong um, in those areas that we need to be. But m again, half the country doesn't require live training, so it's, it's sometimes difficult to find live training. But I became a home inspector by um, online training way back when, and also um, crashing and burning on myself, by myself. Um, so you have to just get out there. Eventually, you're going to have to have the confidence to um, draw the line and be confident that you are, um, that you have the knowledge, skills, and abilities that you're competent enough to do a home inspection. We do that for you all online. And I would also recommend if you have any areas where you can do some live training with other inspectors, mentorship, that'd be great too. But eventually you're going to have to stop that and do an inspection on your own because you feel confident enough to do so. And it typically is reflected in your inspection report. So the way we review uh, members is we take a look at their reports. So if you've never performed, for example, a home inspection, to become a member of InterNACHI, a certified home inspector, you have to perform four inspections and submit your inspection reports for review. And typically, uh, the report will tell you, tell us um, where you are in your competency. Um, terrible inspection reports typically reflect a terrible inspector. Uh, what was the red component on the basement floor near the oil tank? Oh, that was an oil filter. So the oil from the oil tank uh, is filtered through that. It's kind of, it's just like a, a car engine filter. Um, the way I was trained, Jose says, the way I was trained is to only take pictures of things that are defective. Is that okay? I notice you take a ton of pictures. You include all the pictures in a report, or do you give them to a separate CD external hard drive? Yep, we went over this before, uh, earlier in the class, but uh, we talked about video and pictures and providing that information to your clients and how many pictures 
do I take? I take about three, 400 pictures, sometimes 500, 600 if the house is big, old, or has a lot of defects. And then I put all of those pictures on a, I used to do a CD. Now it would be a USB or a download uh, uh, from the cloud and then um, access from the cloud. And then I provide all those pictures and that video to my client. And then I put in the inspection report, because I know it's gonna be read by my client's friends and families, probably not by my client even, um, I want that inspection report to be really robust and reflect the great service I provide and my brand. So I select certain pictures to put in there and it would be maybe 20 pictures. And at the, we're coming up on, on the end of this inspection. We'll go over the report and I can show you the report that I produced for this inspection, if you'd like. Um, so let's see, where are we? We're at the electrical panel. One finger means 100 amps. Two fingers mean 200 amps. One and a half means 150 amps. So this is a 100 amp electrical panel and that is the main shutoff switch. The breakers are not specifically identified. There's some work that needs to be done there. Um, I do not like the homemade um, clip uh, for the well pump, this, um, the submersible pump at the bottom of the well to supply water to the house. Um, those two breakers uh, should have a, um, a proper approved um, uh, connection. I can't think of what that is. It's a connection to connect two breakers so that you turn off the breaker, uh, both breakers at the same time and turn them back on. They are connected to each other. Um, you're not required to remove the dead front cover of any electrical panel. It's a safety hazard. Don't do it. When I do it, I'm wearing goggles, gloves. I'm standing on typically rubber. Um, I, I'm not standing in a puddle of water. There's a lot of things you got to do um, if you're going to remove the dead front cover. Um, I do on every inspection. I exceed the standards of practice for every client. Um, but if you, if you, um, you're not required to, is my point. So don't do it. There's the grounding electrode. All of my pictures of the panel are blurry. I didn't know that until afterwards. It's really, um, I, you know, you really got to take your time taking pictures like this. So make sure it's on micro so you can get up close. Typically the symbol is like a flower or something on your camera. And I don't take pictures high res. I take them very low res, very low resolution. This picture here, even though it's out of focus, let's get another one. Like this picture here is probably the size of uh, 640 by 480, very small, 640 by 480, and it probably weighs about 100 kilobytes. 100 kilobytes, not megabytes. I'm not taking pictures, high resolution, megabytes. They're hard to move around, all those pictures, hundreds especially. You know, you, you need big gigabyte USBs and stuff, right? So low resolution stuff. I throw them in the report, it looks good to me here. Uh, years later, this uh, you can see what's going on in this photo. And this is a very low, this is a 640 by 480 pixels and about 120 kilobyte in size. Low res pictures. That's my recommendation. A lot of home inspectors get in trouble with these huge, big, four megabyte pictures of nothing, like little stuff. You know, you're not, you're not publishing a book. Um, oh yeah, these are the standard, uh, these are the steps that go out to the Bilco door. So open and close that. It shouldn't fall on your head. There's a counterbalance. Um, and then the wall, they didn't finish painting the wall. There must've been a cabinet there or some kind of storage. So you could tell where the wall was painted and where it wasn't. And you can see that we've got a lot of watermarks. I observe indications of previous water intrusion, moisture intrusion, water penetration through the foundation wall, puddling onto the basement floor. And they painted over that stuff. Structural components, I'm looking for notches, holes, cuts in the um, floor joists. We actually have a, an online video training course about um, floor joists. Yeah, so there's just water and potentially mold. While I'm here, I can perform a mold inspection. Sometimes I just carry from ProLab, you can get a, um, uh, here it is, uh, a swab sample. So I carry this in my pouch with me when I'm down in the basement. I don't do a mold air sampling with the pump thing. EPA really 
isn't all that crazy about testing for mold. They even not recommend it if you see it. Because if you see visible mold, it's probably mold. But if my client is so concerned about it and they want to use some kind of report, um, I'll test it, I'll swab it uh, for a few bucks, get it back in the lab, I'll charge extra, maybe even not, and write a report based upon the lab results. Um, I'm a one-stop shop, right? Oh, the other thing that I do is, I wonder if I could show you this. Hmm, let this boot up maybe, hmm? Let's see. Be great if my camera turns on. Ha ha. Love technology when it works. So this is my FLIR infrared camera. It's FLIR C2 camera. It's a FLIR C2. It fits in my pocket. Let's see if I can actually fit in my pocket. Yep, fits in my pocket. Pull it out. You can buy it from Inspector Outlet. Um, members get uh, special pricing. And um, what it does is it finds, it's, it allows you to see things that you wouldn't normally see without it. It's kind of like a flashlight, right? With a flashlight, you can see things like in the dark that you wouldn't normally be able to see without a flashlight. Well, infrared is very similar, very similar. Um, this camera allows me to see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. And what am I seeing? I'm seeing surface temperature, temperatures that is on the surface of things. And water, especially groundwater coming from the ground, tends to be cool. And the house, a comfortable house, is about 75 degrees, let's say. Water temperature, cold water temperature is about 55, 60 degrees. Let's say I have some water there, my spray bottle, about room temperature, both of them. But let's see if I can see it. Oh, yeah. They're both about room temperature, although the air conditioning is on, so it's probably having the room a little bit cool in the water. Water is amazing. It has a great capacity. I can see that from about 10 feet away. Actually, that's on the floor, right? Can you see where I am? Yeah. So just a spray of water. Let me look at it. Uh, can't see it with my eyes. Uh, I can see it with my FLIR C2. So um, water has this great ability to hold energy called a capacitor or a capacity, it has a capacity to hold a lot of energy, and it doesn't want to change its temperature. So it's slow in changing temperature, right? So what you want to do is to find moisture, you change the environment quickly, crank up the heat or turn down the air conditioning, turn on the air conditioning, and change the environment, air and the surface temperatures quickly. Water is real slow and sluggish. It doesn't want to change temperature. It'll hold that temperature. So if it's 60 degrees, it'll stay 60 degrees a lot longer than the environment. So you manipulate the environment in order for you to see the surface temperature of something wet. Water also is the greatest emitter. So it, it's the greatest capacitor of heat energy um, four times more than stone, uh, 20 times more than plaster, and great capacitors or things that substances or materials in a building that can hold heat energy are also great emitters of infrared. And water is the, one of the greatest capacitors out there, holds heat energy, doesn't change temperature very fast, and therefore it's also a great emitter of infrared. It's the greatest emitter of infrared. Out of all the substances and materials in a home, infrared is emitted by water the best. So even after 10 minutes here, it's slow. you can see it's slowly changing temperature. It's now becoming the cool water that I sprayed there is now changing the same temperature as the, as the environment. So you have to manipulate the environment in order to see that infrared signature. So it's kind of cool. I used to do this with my clients. Um, let me see, I'm gonna turn this around. Okay, turn this. Er, this is my sound studio. So I put my hand on the wall. One, two, three. And then show my clients my hand. So it's pretty cool. And then I give my clients the infrared camera to play with. Just, you know, they, they pretty much get it. They see what I'm doing. It was part of my brand. 
and they go, oh man, this is so cool. And they realize, yep, I, I hired the right inspector. And we can talk about marketing and branding, but that was part of my branding. I love basements and crawl spaces and attics because I had my infrared to help me see things that I wouldn't normally be able to see without it. And uh, it's now affordable. This is a very low resolution camera, probably like your first step to get into infrared as a home inspector. Um, if you are want to be a thermographer, scientist uh, with teams of infrared guys and you know, ladies and inspecting uh, electrical um, high wires and horse ankles and things like that, you want something more high res. But for home inspectors, um, this is a pretty good device um, to get into the business. And then I would uh, offer that infrared scan as free with my home inspection. But what I really did was I just raised my fees because I added value to my home inspection. And so I allowed my client to pay for me using technology. I would raise my fees of my home inspection. But I would, my brand was that I became the home inspector who did that free infrared stuff as well. So I don't know how I got onto that. Uh, moisture in the basement, yeah, and tools. Um, any questions? Um, Oh, a tie, breaker clip. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> um, I appreciate it. Um, let's see. Okay, so Gary says, I did several uh, reports on paper in Columbus, Ohio. Now I'm retired and I do home inspections in Florida. I do them on Horizon Report writing. I've heard good things about Horizon Report software. It seems to take me much longer than before. Oh. Well, I wouldn't go back to paper and pencil. I mean, if you told me that um, you do your inspection reports with paper and pencil, um, I would not hire you. Um, and that's because nowadays, nothing personal, but nowadays, home buying clients simply expect the inspection report, the inspector to use technology and the report to be uh, produced with software. I think that's a reasonable expectation nowadays. And if you don't do that, the minimum. Um, yeah, you may have trouble getting jobs. I could be wrong. I'm just, this is my opinion, right? So um, uh, software is uh, a big issue and you have to find the software that works for you and your company. Um, and it's got to work really well. So if you're happy with paper and pencil, hey, go for it. And you're in business, that's awesome. But I, I would highly recommend getting report software. Well, we've been talking a lot and it is almost time to go. We have 10 minutes left. Um, and so I wanted to ask you one thing, another poll. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see this? Do you provide a free home maintenance book to every client? I wanna ask you that. Do you provide a free home maintenance book to every client? A lot of you are answering. I'd like to know that because we have a home maintenance book. I don't know if you know it. But we have a home maintenance book. I'll show you three of them. So we wrote home maintenance books that you give to your client. And uh, I'll let you all vote. A lot of you are voting, still voting, still voting. Oh, this is, this is interesting. You're voting, you're voting. I'll give you five more seconds, okay? Do you provide a free home maintenance book to every client? Five, four, three, two, one. Did you vote? One more chance, vote. People are still voting. I'm gonna close the poll, hurry up, vote, vote, vote. Okay. Can you see the results? Hope you can. All right, so do you, the question is, do you provide a free home maintenance book to every client? Um, a lot of you said yes. Just about the same number, I would say, said no. And many of you said no, but I'm interested in internet, she's home maintenance book. Okay, so we have a home maintenance book. This one's the Spanish version in Spanish, if you have Spanish-speaking clients. Um, this one is for Florida, specifically for your clients in Florida. It doesn't have any oil-fired furnaces <laughs> or oil tanks or basement. Uh, there's just some stuff about basements, but basically it's geared towards Florida um, housing. And um, our um, home maintenance book for just about everyone else in the world. Um, and it's called Now That You've Had a Home Inspection. It's, now That You've Had a Home Inspection, 
It's not my job, right? It's now the house is in your hands. I've done my part. Now that you've had a home inspection, now it's up to you to maintain your home. And this is information that I didn't want to provide to you during the inspection. It will bore you. But it has really good stuff about how to maintain a home and how to maintain um, the roof and um, looking for water um, in, in the basement, things like that, right? Um, and every section, every chapter of the home maintenance book refers to the standards of practice. So it helps set your client's expectations about what you inspect, what you're required to inspect and what you're not required to inspect and it reinforces that. And inside also, there's about a dozen reasons why you should be hired again. And that's for all three of these home maintenance books, all three different ones. Um, and um, you can customize the cover completely. Um, this is $2.70 and for the same price at a certain quantity, you can get this cover back and front um, fully customized. So you can change everything and change the house. You can put, I would say, your logo, your business logo, and your picture of you in action of performing inspections and your contact information on the back. And then when you hand out your report or your report summary to your clients, you bind this, it's punched for a three ring binder, and you give many copies to your clients because they're going to give um, their extra copies to their coworkers and friends and, and agents and things like that. Okay, so I hope you saw that, but I don't know if the poll was in the way or what, but anyways, I, I want to make sure. This is the home maintenance book of Internachi, fully customized. This is the home maintenance book for Florida inspectors. Um, all the content is Florida specific, and this is the one for your Spanish speaking clients. We have a few minutes left. Boy, I don't think we're going to get to the inspection report um, because we have so many problems. There's like sump pumps that don't work. I, I raised the float. You got to be safe on that. The sump pump actually discharges into a pipe that goes outside. I don't know where that's going. You can do some dye testing, but I just, I'm just going to call it a defect right there. Um, and there's a crawl space with no access, and it has exposed dirt or rock on the floor. Speaking of crawl spaces, here's crawl gear, our friends at crawl gear, and they make these wheels, right, that go on your thighs. I love this. We have fun at the House of Horrors. Hope you were here earlier. We went through the House of Horrors um, before class started. And you put it on your thighs and you roll around in the crawl space and you don't kill yourself. And um, the wheels hold up the majority of your weight while the rest of this, while the rest of your body, is moving around in the crawl space with these gloves, right? I love this stuff. I used to do a lot of crawl spaces with personal protection equipment. And um, these are padded elbow, um, padded gloves that go past your elbow so you can crawl around in the crawl space. And of course you need a really good headlamp, right? Really good headlamp. All this equipment, all these tools help you perform a a great home inspection, and you can get all these tools one more time at inspectoroutlet.com. And um, go there, inspectoroutlet.com. Um, we are almost out of time, everyone. Um, everyone's asking questions about what's the best software. Um, pretty happy with Report Host. That's pretty good, yeah. They also give non members free six month membership. I've heard good things about that too. Um, oh, my poll was still showing, my the home maintenance book poll. Okay, so um, I'm going to wrap this class up because um, we're just in the basement. We haven't even gotten to the rest of the, of the home. But we actually can um, share with you um, the rest of the slides. I'm going to put all the slides online and... Um, also, the let me get to it. The sample report, uh, the report itself, the home inspection report. So there's my inspection report. You can take a look at the inspection report based upon the inspection that we just did. I'm sorry we're running out of time. I don't want to respect your time. And um, if you have any questions, feel free. But I'm going to show you where to go to download the 
slides of this class, the report itself, and to watch the video recording um, of this class. And it's right here. It's at www.nachi.org slash class. Okay? So go there and um, you can um, register for the next upcoming class. You can watch all of our past classes because they've all been uh, video recorded. And we have um, a new podcast um, coming up. Um, there's a, a handful of Seer episodes uh, of the Home Inspector podcast produced by InterNACHI, and I'm on the podcast. So um, have fun. And my name is Ben Gramico. I'm from InterNACHI. That's the International Association of Certified Home Inspectors. And I will see you in class next time. Thanks, everybody.